Horror Cast! This town is full of monsters. How can you sit there and eat pizza? Hey, this is Dina. This is Tony. And welcome to this very special episode of the Horror Cast for December 2011, your podcast for all things horror related. We missed a couple months, but this one should make up for it because we've got a big treat for you Silent Hill fans. We have a very special guest with us today, and please introduce yourself because I want to make sure I don't mispronounce your name. Hello, I'm Guy Sehe, and I play James Sunderland in awesome. Silent Hill 2. Awesome. So how are you doing today? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? Pretty good. Good. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that? that was my squee, Dina. You know? Okay. I had to get my squee out. Okay, so, you know, I should be fine now. So, you know. <laughs> Again, uh, James, thank you so, so very much for taking the time out to, to do this. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. You're welcome. I thought about doing this as James, but I don't think that's a good idea. So <laughs> please call me Guy. Okay. Uh, if I if I get into the character of James, you may not get as much out of me. Oh, He's I'm kind of quiet. Oh, I'm He's sorry. Kind of quiet. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I call you James? I am so sorry. Yes. <laughs> if you want me to slip into character, I can I can do it. But uh, <laughs> I, I think it'd be a little more uh, lighthearted if we stay with with me. Guy, thank you very very much, uh, Dina, and I really really appreciate you taking the time out to do this. It means a lot. My pleasure. So you have been making yourself known on the internet over this last year or so due to the situation with the Silent Hill HD collection. Tell us all about that, how it all started for you, and where we are now, and feel free to clear the air about any part of it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> the HD collection came about, the announcement for it came about, I don't know, half a year after I became aware that there were fans of Silent Hill 2 I, and this, the entire franchise and series. I really was unaware of it. it, it it's not a part of the uh, internet or the, the spheres of knowledge that I keep, keep tabs on normally. <laughs> so uh, I think people, a few fans tracked me down, which is really quite a considerable achievement when you think about how little uh, credit the the actors were given in the in the uh, credit roll, and you have to you have to scroll through the entire credit roll and and pause to see our names. <laughs> and uh, then some fans started tracking me down, and then uh, I responded politely. I learned very quickly about being careful about what you say <laughs> uh, in responses because people take everything; they take it off your. Your, your own pages, they certainly swipe material from everywhere and then repost it. So they're forums where people were uh, posting information. And then, of course, with Google, others are able to search it. And it started to spiral from there. I set up my Facebook page and I, because I'm not really a blogger or a forum uh, frequenter, I use that as the way to communicate with, with Silent Hill 2 fans. And that that was my first introduction to them, and I, I met you, Dina, at about that time, and you, we did, uh, what we do together first? I did something with you. What was that? <laughs> uh, the episode of the Game Den where I... Oh, right. You contacted me and asked me to record those lines mm -hmm. for the uh, segment you did on Silent Hill 2. That was really nice. That... Yeah. Well, the funny part is that wasn't even, sorry to interrupt, but the funny part is that isn't even why I contacted you. I just contacted you just kind of for the hell of it, because I thought uh -huh. it'd be cool to talk to you. And then it just kind of hit me while I was working on the game, and I'm like, duh, I can have, I'll ask him to do it. <laughs> okay. And then, as I say, about, so that started slowly snowballing, and more and more people were introducing to their friends and fellow fans that they had talked to me and then more people came along and asked if they could friend me and I said, it was fun. Uh, then then there was this furor that came out. They announced the, actually, the first I heard about it wasn't that the HD collection was coming out. The first I heard about it was this, I got an email from uh, a fellow at Konami who introduced himself as a VP of licensing in California. You know, my relationship with Konami had been with Konami in Japan. 
So this was a first. And he wrote a very short memo like, hello, I hope you're well. Please sign the release form attached because we are unable to locate the documents in our files. And uh, let's, I wrote back, and now, by now, I was aware that Silent Hill 2 was quite popular and mm. what we call a backlist hit in publishing, and it can be reissued and make money without much development costs. So it's quite a valuable property. So I'm, uh, and I have a long history in intellectual property and copyrights and, and licensing. So I was I'm thinking, hmm. So I talked to Dave, who I keep in regular contact with, and I did not contact Monica at that time, but I later did. And uh, we were all kind of surprised that they had released it several times already for different platforms. Mm -hmm. There were no documents, there were no contracts signed, there were no release documents. If there were supposed to be, someone dropped the ball on their side. Uh, so anyway, long story short, the uh, I wrote back and said, look, I, I understand you guys want to keep releasing the, the program and that's great, uh, but I think we really need to come to a resolution on some additional consideration for uh, the fact that it's been reused on different platforms than, and different territories than what was originally agreed to. And so, so then they just went silent and disappeared. They did a 180 and set out to record new voices without engaging me in dialogue or any of the other actors. I later learned that Monica did essentially the same thing. They contacted her, she refused to sign and said, hey, you, you owe me money and you used my face in the making of video. And that's not right either. Dave said the same thing. Donna continues, uh, she played Angela. Donna continues to work with Konami in Tokyo. So she, according to Dave, she said that she had signed. Uh, I, I don't speak with Donna, but uh, Dave does. Well, Dave spoke to her and Donna told Dave, according to Dave, that she was going to sign, uh, but she didn't, interestingly enough. Hmm. She kind of just hung out there. Maybe she was waiting to see what would happen. And then it was a standoff. So here on the one hand are the actors saying, you owe us money or at least thanks for reusing our material without permission. And they went silent. And that, and that was kind of like that for a while. Um, and fans continued to pile in and weigh in. Then I think, I forget the exact sequence of events, but let's just say it goes like this. There's some fan interest or concern. Tom Hewlett posted samples of the new voices. And then within a week of the new voice samples going up, uh, Troy and Mary Elizabeth McGlynn, the two of the new uh, character actors, were speaking, were, were recorded or, or posted comments that were somewhat accusatory toward me, saying that, well, this is all Guy's fault. <laughs> and I'm like, oh man, okay, that's their strategy. They're going to blame Guy. And they were all using similar words to, to uh, point the finger at me. And I thought, man, this looks like a a coordinated plan here to yeah. make Guy the bad guy on <laughs> fans. And so then I started getting concerned because I, I don't want to be seen as a bad guy blocking this this program. I just felt really angry and miffed that they, you know, never even said thank you to, to any of us and never uh, gave us free copies of the game, never invited us to a con, never did anything. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, they blurred my face out no. in the makeup video. So that, well, on the one hand, people were speculating that I was somebody really famous, which was cool. But on the other <laughs> hand, <laughs> on the other hand, uh, it was insulting, and and I thought, ah, oh, this is this is a mess. Um, okay, well, they have my mocap. The image looks like me, and there were no sketches of James, other than one very rough sketch with no detail. Mm -hmm. Uh, before they hired me. So everything that they did with James came after they hired me. They had some things for Mary before they hired uh, Monica, but she obviously is similar to the character in many respects. So we got a multitude of rights that are involved in the product beside the voices. A lot of people misunderstand that this is like a voice recording job. We walked into a studio because a lot of games are done that way. They go into the studio a couple of days, they record voices off the script 
they have a guy there who helps them understand and you know, get into the character at that point in the game because they know the game better than the actors do and then they uh or the or the story i should say better than the actors and then that's it they, you know it's it's quick work it's not very high paying this was different we were we worked at it a long long time on the stage uh, performing the scenes live with all the characters simultaneously so when we went into the recording studio it, it was easy to get into the <laughs> character and be James and and for Monica to be Mary or Maria because man we cried and yelled and screamed and ran and did all these things in real life on the stage with stage hands watching us and directors and cameras rolling and mocap equipment going so I mean it, it was easy it was easy to be real with the the characterization I think so anyway here we are the uh, Tom Hewlett puts this video up and the, the new voices are there and, and I'm listening to them Some, someone immediately posted it on my Facebook page and I, I listened to it and I'm like my heart just dropped into my stomach oh god those guys are good well, wait a minute are they really good i don't even know anymore so i'm listening they sound very hollywood you know big mm -hmm. deep voices and heavy rough tumbles and a really nice vocal performances characteristic voices but um hmm. so there i was i'm in a uh, kind of struggling and i still hadn't talked to monica about it I'm thinking, what should I do? Uh, and then the, the the parody video came out. Oh, <laughs> the perfect guys that. did, right? That was awesome. Some, I and think somebody the, else did that one actually. Okay, well, okay, someone else did that one. But first was the comparison and yeah. like, don't buy this. Don't don't buy this new HD collection. And I thought, oh my god, people people like me. They liked my performance. Wow, <laughs> this is really good. Um, and then, then it, from there, it went from, well, I have to give credit where credit's due. A fellow, a friend of mine named Julian Tomlinson was visiting Tokyo and we were out for dinner with, he was there with some other people and I was recounting the story. This is right after that, that comparison had come up and they were blaming me uh, for, as the reason. And I was faced with a choice. I'm going to fight Konami, which would mean going to court in LA and seeking an injunction to prevent distribution of the HD collection. Well, that, you know, I know that's not going to make me popular with anybody. And there's a lot of people out there saying I had no right to do this anyway, that I had signed a release and so forth. So I thought this is going to confuse people. And and Julian patiently listened and he's a brilliant guy and a, and a creative, he's a writer and an editor as well. And so I think he was looking at it as a story. And he said, guy, do you really care about getting any more money out of Konami? And I thought, it was like a light went off in my head. No, I really don't. I wouldn't get that much anyway. <laughs> so it would, I probably all burn it up in legal fees. So the heck with that. No, I don't want to do it. He goes, well, what do you think about that? I mean, doesn't that change your options? I said, I was like, whoa. So within two days, I, with Julian's help, uh, he helped me to craft the notion and and then i wrote the open letter he said why don't you offer to waive all your rights and i quickly checked with uh dave because i figured well it's you know one thing for me to do it but I, it, it's not enough they're going to need all of us to do it right i quick check with dave and um he said that he would he'd go along with what i decided but he wasn't very happy about it yeah and uh i figured that donna had already signed because that's what i'd been told and then uh i wrote to monica <laughs> I wrote to Monica and she still had no idea that there was such a thing as Silent Hill 2 fans. She, she had no idea. She's just living, living her life in LA wow. with her daughter as, uh, and, and doing her thing. And so I wrote to her out of the blue. I said, I, I found her on Facebook. I wrote to her. I said, uh, oh, one other thing about the open letter I, before I go forward on, on Monica. That open letter, you sh everyone should understand, because some people were questioning, well, why did he publish this as an open letter on Facebook? That's where he should have just contacted. I, I did con contact Konami uh, about a, the day before the open letter went up. I sent email to the to the guy who had contacted me about the rights uh, release form. And I also 
track down Tom Hewlett and I track down the original executive producer in Japan. I've forgotten his name right now and he's probably happy about that. He won't, <laughs> he's probably happier not to have his name out there. And I wrote to these people and I sent them all a copy of it and I said, look, let's go for a win-win situation here. Nobody has to lose. Everybody comes out uh, a winner and the, fa include the fans, uh, the producer of the new version and the original um, actors because we'll waive our rights. And I, I stepped a little out of my risk, my comfort zone, and I said, I, if I'm sure I can bring Dave and Monica in, and, and, and I hadn't yet, but I thought, I thought <laughs> I'll figure out a way to do this, right, for yeah. the fans. So, uh, so then the open letter went up, and um, I thought about how I was going to get Dave, and I had a strategy for Dave, and and that worked. It, it generally involved a lot of partying together. <laughs> <laughs> and my strategy for Monica was was to get her to you know waive her rights. Was, I wrote to her and I, I said, "Hi, Monica, are you are you willing to forgive me after all these years?" That was how I opened the conversation. And she's <laughs> like, "Oh, of course. What are you talking about? Good to hear from you." And that that goes back to a little tension we had on the set one day. I, you know, Silent Hill Two is a very dark and right. angry and scary drama and the you know, Maria and James are acting out some very dramatic scenes and then Mary and James are acting out some very very difficult sentimental and emotional scenes there's a huge amount of, of emotion coming out of us in tears and mm -hmm. as I say on this and it, it eventually led to friction uh, between Monica and I one day which I, I think only enhanced our performances frankly but Oh. I, I I thought she might remember that <laughs> she, she did. <laughs> and so, you know, when, when it comes to women, all you guys listening out there, it, it always pays to apologize first. Okay? <laughs> Don't let your pride get in the way of you know what you think is right or wrong. Forget about that. Just start with an apology and then you know just keep listening. And so I apologized first. And then she said, oh, no, no, nothing's wrong. And then she started talking about uh, organizing against Konami, because if we got together, it would be we would be more successful in, in achieving a settlement. And I'm like, oh, OK, this is going to be a little harder than I thought. <laughs> She's ready to you know, because I was there. I had been there. Right. We're going to going to go after him, get justice. So uh, I thought, all right, I'm going to work this out because I've already, on the one hand, promised Konami, or not promised, but kind of said to Konami that I could bring <laughs> him in. So I did. I started to do what the fans had done for me. I started in, I said, look, you, you need to understand this thing is more than just you and me. It's really, really important for a lot of people. And they're like 20 to 25 years old now. And they're really vocal on the internet. So, <laughs> you really don't want to be on the wrong side of this one. I think there's more upside than there is money in it for us. So I, I didn't put it in those words exactly, but that was my feeling. And it was the simple act of introducing her to the fans. And, you know, she now has more followers on Facebook than I do. because <laughs> She's so popular, right? And oh, wow. she's that... Remember when she passed about 600 or 700 friends in three days, <laughs> she she knew that it wasn't about the money. It was about doing the right thing for the fans, and it was it was easy. So then after that, she became our ambassador to smooth things out. So the first thing <laughs> I had to do was, you know, defuse Troy Baker and uh, uh, what's her name, Mary Elizabeth McQuinn, because they got off. I am sure they were given misleading information or they, they jumped to a conclusion because of the differences in Japanese game production and American game production. They make games in either Canada or the US, wherever they're located. We, we made this game in Japan. And as Dave Shoffley points out accurately, in Japan, when a game is re-released on a new platform or in a new territory, the actors are first asked and it's, 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 it's a Japanese thing you know they, they're gonna do it anyway but they ask it's manners 
right. and then they pay uh, a fee and it's a percentage of the original fee. So that's standard practice here. In the U.S. it's not. So they assumed that U.S. rules were applying and they jumped to that conclusion. They all did. Uh, all the U.S. people did. And, they, and then, you know, Japan was being probably cagey about it, their executives and talking with their U.S. production team about what the actual situation was. And there's a bunch of finger pointing going around as to whether there were releases signed and whether there weren't. It turns out there weren't any releases or contracts signed by any of the first four Silent Hill uh, game performers and, and, and actors, right? None of us. Right. Um, so that that's why the HD collection, you know, I'm sorry, I lifted the lid off that stinky can of worms, but once I started asking questions publicly, it, it became a, uh, he said, she said, finger pointing, uh, festival of mudslinging it was horrible so the yeah. uh, longer story short the best solution was <laughs> to give waive our rights because we didn't need the money we weren't going to get much anyway and go for fan uh, support and help help maintain what our role in the game my gosh at that point I thought oh my god they're going to cut me out of this game. I, I actually like being part of this. This is important <laughs> to me. And, and and I think Monica felt the same way. I know Dave did. So it was like, whoa, well, we don't want that either. So that, that made it easy to decide. So there's a lot, a lot of my ramblings about what went on in my head and how and what I did to, to position it so that it could end up the way it has. And I'm glad that it did. And it's it's a tribute to all of the fans because their steady and sometimes very noisy pressure <laughs> is the reason we got this result. And it's nice because it doesn't happen very often. Yeah. The game companies listen. But I think we got to give some credit to Tom Hewlett mm -hmm. for bothering to try. Because if he hadn't done it, and, and pro possibly Devin as well, if they hadn't tried to get the original voices back in, and it was work to do that for them, mm -hmm. then it would not have happened. And they would have just, well, they probably would have been hounded for years by angry fans. But <laughs> I mean, that's part of why they got to win, too. It made life easier for them. That was that little gift I gave Tom at the dinner that night. I gave him a spent cartridge because it was a bullet <laughs> avoided. It was a kind of a, a, a metaphorical or right. symbolic gesture or gift like <laughs> hey I, I didn't mean that as a threat to him i meant it as hey we all miss this bullet mm -hmm. because we cooperated and that that's a good thing <laughs> wow okay well now we know more of the story than, than we did going in so right. yeah Actually, just to, to wrap up how it concluded was people have asked me well how how did the negotiations go with konami there actually weren't any negotiations Wow. We never, they, they, we never talked to each other. I got that email. I responded saying, I think we need to settle some additional compensation. And I never heard from them again. I never mm -hmm. heard from them again until the dinner <laughs> in L.A. <laughs> <laughs> um, My God. Monica went and talked to them a little bit. Just since she said, guy, they're really nice guys. You know, there's no big plot or anything. You got to. Because, you know, these are these are good guys. They they really love the game, and you'll see when you meet them. Well, and that was it. So there were no negotiations. Everything happened in the public uh, domain on Facebook, Tumblr, uh, blogs, forums. Everything happened in the open on that, and it was all fan pressure and fan support, and some fans who didn't care. I mean, there there are people out there if you read the the forums carefully you'll see there's a lot of people who don't like our, the original yeah. performances so it, it, they, they, they were welcoming the new voices that kind of um i mean they're people have different tastes obviously so that's fine and uh so there weren't any negotiations it, it all happened and and then suddenly Monica said, hey, they're going to do their best to get she talked to them right she, she I, uh, we all agreed Dave and I and Donna agreed to let Monica talk to them for us because she's <laughs> diplomatic 
and I had become a kind of lightning rod and a scary person. I'm like James, right? I'm either going to beat you with this stick or shoot you with this pistol. So, so nobody wanted to deal with the guy hiding in the closet with the gun. So they, they, uh, Monica went put on her sexy Mary act, and she, she you know, smoothed it over. And, and it was more at that point about Tom and Devin convincing Konami Japan to you know, go with it. Let's let's do this. This is a good thing, and they they agreed. So that the, the the dinner, Tom's announcement didn't come until what like four or five days after our dinner in L.A. Mm-hmm. Uh, he put up the official announcement, and at the dinner he said, you know, they both nodded and winked and said, it's a done deal. It's a done deal. We're just we're waiting for the official word from Tokyo. So apparently the official word came after the dinner when things went well and and he could report back everything's cool. The official word came out and he posted that up online. So that was great. Uh, So that's the story on the negotiations, quote unquote. (laughs) It all happened in public. And again, it's thanks to the fans. God bless the internet. People like you guys. Yeah. And and, (laughs) uh, folks like you and... um, and many others who were really moved by Silent Hill 2. Tried to go to a less dramatic side now and get into some more uplifting <laughs> stuff. Uh, how did you uh, get the role of, of, of James? Was it something that you just heard about, like, oh, so-and-so is having a, uh, an audition for a video game, or was it something that... Like, as soon as you saw it, it was just like, I have to be in this. No, it, it was just a lucky twist of fate that I got the part. I had recently left my position at a publishing company, which I'd worked at for 15 years. And so I was in between gigs, as it were. And uh, in fact, I wasn't even living in Tokyo. My children with my first wife were, were living here. They were in. Uh, junior high school and elementary school and I was coming back often to visit them and my daughter who was I believe 10 at the time maybe she was 13 or 12 uh, um, Jeremy Blaustein had gone around I believe it was him and posted uh, audition notices in the international schools was hire, they wanted to hire the English speaking talent in Japan it's hard to find them, especially a child. So they, usually they go to the international schools where uh, English is the language of instruction and their uh, expats' children attend. So my, uh, there was a notice describing a job for a PlayStation game. It didn't say anything about Silent Hill. It just said PlayStation game. PlayStation was still pretty new at that time. And she asked me if I would take her to the audition, which coincided with one of my visits to Tokyo. And I said, uh, well, sure, uh, darling, tell me what it's about. And she said, I don't really know. It's somehow, you know, you like act out this part and then they, they use your, your body movements to make uh, the characters in the game. It's like a role play game kind of thing. And they need a girl. And, you know, so I, I think I, I want to try that. I said, okay, sure. Uh, so on the day uh, I went with her and um, sit, sit, sat in the lobby area where there were some other actors trying out as well. And as I was sitting there, there were like scraps of the script uh, on a, the side table next to the chairs on the, or the sofa where I was sitting. And I was looking at them and there were, uh, said James, and there were some lines and a fellow came out and he was sitting across from me. He had just finished his audition and um, in his m- m- late 20s and par- apparently he had just read for James. So I, I said to him, w- w- what's this all about? Uh, and he, he kind of described the motion capture aspect and then the recording aspect. And he happened to mention that this was a really good gig because this job paid really well. There were for, for foreign talent in Japan, there aren't that you know, many good jobs, and this is like the top echelon, because these guys pay well. 
So I'm listening to that. Now, I, that didn't really mean much to me because it's not my career, but it, I have heard people say that it was uh, slim pickings. There weren't many, you know, actors to choose from. But this guy was a pro. He made his life doing that, as does Dave and, and, and other people who, who tried out. So anybody who was in the business went to audition because this is a well-paying gig and it's um, it was pretty well publicized that they were hiring. So anyway, I'm, I'm sitting there thinking what, and, and my daughter was gone for quite a while. And I, um, I saw this guy kind of wandering back and forth. He looked like he, he was somehow involved with the production. So I said, um, excuse me, could I, do you think it's possible that I could read for this part? And he looked at me kind of strange because uh, probably people don't speak like that, right? <laughs> and he said, <laughs> you know, talk to him like that. And he said, uh, oh, well, do you, do you have any acting experience? And I said, well, yes, I, I've acted in uh, programs before, uh, video programs, and I, and I studied acting in college, and I performed in college and in high school and you know, like that. And he said, well, let me check. And he went in to the other room and came back a little while later, and he said, yeah, you can, they said you can try because they haven't cast the part yet. They haven't made their mind up yet. So sure, you, you can give it a go. So I went in and did my audition, uh, and um, I got the part. I didn't know that. I did the audition. It was fun. I was all pumped up because I haven't performed for people in a long time, and it was it was just fun. They they wanted me to read some lines. They wanted me to emote. They wanted me to mime actions. They go over here and do this. So, so I, I, I I understood what they were looking for. They wanted to see body movements that were characteristic. For the, for the part, they wanted to hear the voice. They wanted to see if I could call up rich emotion. And uh, that wasn't so hard for me because as you know, James has got a lot of pain and, and, and anguish he's dealing with. And uh, it flares up as anger, but not very often. He kind of keeps it all quiet. So it's very much like me. And I had had, had a recent, bad divorce which was uh, easy made it easy for me to emote pain and sadness and weep openly imagining the death of Mary so that that made it uh, that was pretty powerful I think when I left I felt I had done a good job but I had no I had no expectations that I would get the part I didn't hear that I got the part until almost three months later when I, I left a number with them uh, for my house in New York. And then I heard, I got a call from Jeremy Blaustein about three months later, as I say, he was uh, in the States at the time. And he, he said, you got the part. I didn't remember who he was and I didn't know what he was talking about. So I said, what part? Because <laughs> three months have gone by, right? Three months have gone by, so yeah, like, what part? Uh, the part, you know, Silent Hill, the, the, you know, the game. I'm like, oh, right, wow, <laughs> I got the part, yeah, well, that's great, um, but how about my daughter? And he's just like, who? Oh, uh, oh, 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 I'm sorry, um, no, she didn't get the part. I was like, oh, I see, well... You know, I really appreciate the offer and, and all, but um, really wasn't my audition. I It was just a lark I auditioned. It was, I'm going to need to check with my daughter because I don't want her to think, you know, badly of me if I take this and, and she didn't get the part. Right. And so he's, he's like, oh, man, you don't understand. This is a really important thing. You, 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 you have to do this. I'm like, well... I appreciate that, but my daughter's important to me too. Yeah. So if you don't mind, I'll check with her first and I'll get back. To you, okay? <laughs> and I'm not trying to make him seem like a bad guy at the time. He was just surprised because right. I think it isn't, again, it was a case of this was a good job. So he, um, he, he, he waited and I, you know, with the time difference, I called my daughter in Tokyo 
pretty soon after, and then I said to her, hey, uh, remember that game we tried out for? She she said, uh, yeah. I said, well, um, and I, I paused, and I think she blurted out, did you get the part? <laughs> and, I said, and I said, I did. They offered me the part. She goes, I knew it. I knew you would get that part. <laughs> I said, well, darling, you didn't get the part, though. And I'm, I, I don't want to do it if, if you're, if you feel bad or I don't, because it was your audition. She's, no way, Dad, go for it. I knew that you're perfect. You should do that. Oh, well, well, it was really sweet. So, I uh, took the part. I called back Jeremy and I said I would do it. So that, that was that. That's how I got it. I later learned, funny, funny, right? I later learned. Actually, I only learned this when we were out partying together from with Dave. Hmm. I said, Dave. Dave got the part of Eddie the exact same way. His daughter was attending wow. international school, and they had posted the notice there, a different school than my daughter. And the daughter asked Dave to take him to the audition. And Dave, <laughs> Dave was there in the lobby, and they thought he was there to try out for Eddie. <laughs> Sorry. Dave's, Dave's nobody's fool, and he's in the business, so of course he tried out. Yeah. And same, same. He got the part. Fortunately, his daughter did not. And I didn't know this. I met Dave much later in the production set. So <laughs> that's how I got the part. Now, wow. I, I later, again, looking back, I can tell you why I got the part. I do know that. Now, I asked mm. Sato and the other uh, director who were most closely connected with creating the character of James visually and, and story-wise. And they were on the audition panel. There were four of them sitting on the panel in front of me. And uh, I asked them why I, uh, they chose me and how many people that, that they had rejected. Because I was, you know, Jason, my ego here, like, okay, how many people did I be for this part? <laughs> I'm really good. I'll go home and tell my wife I'm a real actor and everything. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> So they said uh, there, you know, quite a few people had tried out, um, but that number is, I won't say a number because my memory is bigger than what other people have said. So anyway, let's say it was about 50, okay? <laughs> As, uh, um, he said, you got the part because in our mind, you are exactly how we imagined James. Wow. So... Well, that makes a lot of sense, right? So people ask me, are you going to do more games? Are you going to continue a career in voice acting? And I said, yeah, right. Uh, if there was, it, it'd be hard for me to do that. I'm James and James, <laughs> James is, is a form or a variant of me. Uh, James doesn't, I don't have happily the heavy, heavy burden that James was carrying, but I understand it. I definitely understand what happened and where he was and how he thought and why he didn't kill himself. And I know exactly why he didn't kill himself. I know why he wanted to live. And I know why he killed Mary, because I, I, I just understand that. It was all part and parcel of my past experiences. So it was easy for me. And, and yes, in that way. There are some things people have asked me, well, you know, are there parts of the character that are like you and parts that are not like you? There are more parts like me than there are parts not like me. The parts that are not like me in the performance are cut scenes that are not real cut scenes. Okay, so a real cut scene mm -hmm. is when Monica, Dave, and I, and or Donna performed the scene live usually many times to get it right. And it was recorded in sequence. And a not real cutscene is something that was recorded in abstract and the programmers created a scene with it. These Japanese programmers created a scene with it without really knowing <laughs> how or why or what James was thinking. They had, they had their idea of what James was thinking. I, the best example of that, the one that pops to my head, is 
and, and you'll know it better than I do, actually, because I've I've not I don't know exactly where in the game it takes place. But James is is in a room, and he's he's in a closet with sla a s slatted door, mm -hmm. so you can see through the slits in the door. And Pyramid Head is comes into the room, and James I think he finds bullets for the revolver in there, and he's looking at Pyramid through the door. I remember doing the mocap for that, but. There's no voice, right? So he's just sitting in there watching Pyramid through the door. And then suddenly, James, the Pyramid Head, I think, looks at the closet door and pauses in front of it. And James looks through the door and then he starts shooting from inside the closet <laughs> at Pyramid. I promise you folks, I would never do that. <laughs> That's good to know, because that wasn't a very smart thing for him to do. That was the dumbest thing he could have done. I mean, okay. <laughs> kick the door open and start shooting and running for the exit. But you are trapped in a closet and you're shooting at this thing. You have no idea whether that's going to work or not. I mean, at least be running for the door, right? <laughs> so is that the first time he sees Pyramid Head when he's in that closet? That's the first time during a cutscene. There's a, a scene earlier where he sees Pyramid Head through some bars, like through during gameplay. But that's the first cutscene where he sees Pyramid Head, and he sees Pyramid Head, and he immediately hides in the closet, which I thought was a little weird. <laughs> See, that is weird, and I promise you, that was that's like a not real cutscene. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because that. And if, that... I, if they had asked me, I would say no. Ex-military <laughs> in possession of a firearm, I'm not going to hide in the closet. I might. I, there's no exit, right? Hiding is fine. That's observation. But in a closet, when there's only one door, I don't think so. so. <laughs> yeah, because I actually kept thinking about that scene, like the first time you see Pyramid Head in that scene and he's doing whatever he's doing to those mannequins. Mm -hmm. Like, I go in that door, I see that, my first instinct is, I'll come back later. <laughs> you know? I mean, my first thing is to is to not like oh instead of going back into the hallway, I'll go into the closet, trapping myself in this room. Right. There are a few other scenes that are not real cutscenes, and then there are the real ones, and the real ones play really well, as as you know from uh, continued. Well, I mean, just why it's so popular. These 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 scenes grab you. They're real, and they're they. They touch places inside your your psyche that are dark, and they, but boy, they stick with you. You can't hear this story or read it or watch it without being moved by it. It just stops people. I got a letter. The name on the envelope said Mary. It's impossible. <laughs> it couldn't possibly be true. A dead person can't write a letter. So once you hear that, you you just stopped, you know, it's, it, it's instant tension and drama and sucks people in. So it's a great story. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs>